All right, uh, we are live from Austin, Texas. <laughs> Casey Dunn, uh, thank you so much for for joining me to chat about photography today. Yeah, um, looking forward to it. Yeah, uh, never done one of these before, so yeah, I'm definitely excited to talk some shop. Awesome. Yeah, me too. Uh, well, I, I've been looking uh, quite a bit at uh, your portfolio. In fact, I've got it up here and uh, I've spent a, a lot of time just really enjoying your images. Uh, you've just got a, a clean, beautiful editorial style f uh, photographs, um, always incredible skies, uh, amazing light. Um, every one of your images is just beautifully staged. Uh, your uh, Skya project in uh, Lake Flato, uh, like oh my god absolutely gorgeous incredible images um you've got the, almost this sort of uh i'd say like voyeuristic approach to to a lot of your photography you're kind of looking through a lot of foreground elements and 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 you get the sense that in some cases um it, you're sort of in a distant observer and I, I really like that about your work um one thing i notice is that you often you'll just kind of use the edge of something, the edge of a bed or the edge of a countertop or something. And, and you'll really hone in on the details of a space and, and focus on what this, the true subject is rather than kind of going for that easy, big wide shot uh, that a lot of us are, are often guilty of. So, uh, you do that exceptionally well. And, and it, it allows that, that, that approach allows a real focus on the, the details that are most important to the viewer. Um, it also kind of gives a nice high end feel. Um, so anyway, I just I really loved going through all of your images. Um, you've got a, a beautiful aesthetic and and that's one of the reasons why I want to talk to you very much about uh, kind of your philosophy and your artistic approach to, to photography. So I'm just honored that you've taken the, the time to sit down and, and chat with me. So thank you. Yeah, I'm super excited to get into it. Um, I guess to start, I think that my overall like just touching on some of the stuff that you've, stuff that you've talked about. A lot of my um, experience comes from early days of shooting in magazines and then also in shooting books. Um, I've shot four or five books in my career and a lot of um, kind of piecing together a narrative for a book is about how you can, in 10 shots, walk a viewer through a space. And so you're always giving these little cues of where this image might, or where, where this space might fall within the broader um, uh, kind of the, the project. So I'm like, I'm trying to say like, well, I want to, I want to show this one view, but I know that I need to like incorporate some of the kitchen later. So I'm going to like peek in maybe a chair that we may see later. And so a lot of it is this like kind of um these visual cues of trying to get somebody all the way through the experience of a house in maybe less images than you would have like these days with digital you know a lot of editorial outlets you can run 15 20 images but usually in a book or in a magazine we were limited um to eight to ten in the beginning and in the books i've been recently it's it's usually in the chapters are probably like you know 10 pages long um, so it's a way to be like a little bit more concise and to give the feeling of the space without trying to like really zoom out or really shoot, you know, 25 pictures for a, uh, uh, for a story. So you sort of feel like that, that requirement to keep it in as few images as possible is what's really developed that, that technique or that style. I think that that played played a part in it and how it kind of evolved and how it's kind of like that's that's an influence on my work. It's not always the way that I approach you know every um, every shoot every shoot, but certainly that kind of like um, that exercise has definitely informed the way that I approach the you know the whole process. Um, and but certainly like if there are other parameters involved, I I definitely like shift um, as needed based on you know you know what we're trying to shoot shoot for or if it's for a magazine versus for a client or um you know all the things that we're normally taking into account when we're when we're shooting yeah okay and we're definitely going to dive deep into your your books that you've done um they're beautiful and uh, i want to talk to you lots about those taking a bit of a step back um i i saw that you were at the brooks institute uh in the early 2000s uh which if, if anyone doesn't know that was pretty much one of the top uh, photography schools in the world at the, at the time uh maybe have a bit of a fall from grace story but uh it, it was a pretty a pretty uh, popular pretty um uh 
renowned school in the day. So I mean, where that question is going is, um, uh, you know, it, it, I think with a lot of architectural photographers, there tends to be sort of three general approach to getting into photography. Either you go to school, uh, you become an assistant, uh, or it's, a, you know, a lot of trial and error in YouTube. So it, I wonder if you can talk about your experience at Brooks and, and, and if you would sort of advocate for one route of learning architectural photography over another. Hmm. Um, I guess I, I, I'm kind of smiling because every time I hear Brooks, I'm like, it's kind of a mixed feeling of like, I looked so fondly upon that uh, experience, but I also am so sad that it's gone. And like, and I'm also excited that you know of Brooks, I guess we're like similar in age. And now I, I feel like, you know, um, I'm wondering if less and less people will know what Brooks is. And cause there was a time when like, even in the early ages, early stage of my career, we're like architects, other photographers, a lot of my clients were aware of Brooks um, and it had a great reputation. So it was such such a bummer that like uh, it, it kind of went away and there's still a contingent of photographers, even in Austin, that kind of graduated in a similar time that went to Brooks who are, st who are still doing amazing work. Mm -hmm. Like I went to school with Ryan Ford, who's another photographer, who shoots interiors in Austin, Matt Rainwaters, uh, uh, the Voorhees, Bill Salins, Hayden Spears, like all these kind of like people that were in a similar era of of going to Brooks that are still shooting professionally in Austin. So I'm glad that it still has um, uh, a level of of prominence. Um, uh, and and to, your, to your other question, I don't think that there is necessarily uh, a a right way to... Um, to get into whatever pursuit that is that you decide to be um, uh, what you do with your life. But for me, it was, I, in a lot of ways, just felt very young to be going out and convincing people uh, to pay me a bunch of money to take photographs of their buildings. And I knew very early, even before that, I went to ACC in Austin, um, who had a uh, an articulation agreement which is basically like saying that all the credits from Austin Community College would transfer to Brooks. But I knew in the beginning, I was like, I want to go to Brooks. I want to take pictures of architecture and this is going to be my path. And it was more just that I was 20 years old and I was like, I can't go out there and tell someone that you need to pay me thousands of dollars to, um, to go and, you know, and photograph your building. And so I think I just needed that, that pause. And I also felt like I needed like, um, I had some tool, some tools certainly, um, and some training. So, but like these days, it's amazing to see like what people are learning on YouTube and just like putting together by just like uh, cobbling together all the resources um, that they have at their fingertips just with their computer. Um, and I, I will say also with assisting, I did assist. I moved to New York after uh, I went to Brooks, and I assisted for a lot of different types of photographers while I was there. Mm -hmm. And one of the architectural photographers who I still am in contact with, uh, this guy, Chuck Choi, great, great photographer and has like a really traditionalist approach to shooting architecture, super talented, was an early kind of inspiration for me. Um, and just the experience of assisting, I think is so invaluable, um, not only with shooting architecture, but also with assisting in other types of work um because as it is now i sometimes get into shooting portraits all of it is within the realm of space but um and over the past you know 10 years i've started to shoot more kind of environment, environmental portraiture and i have no tricks up my sleeve because i didn't ever assist for any of those types of photographers and it's i don't have the chance now to go back and be like oh i want to go and you know work <laughs> with like the best portrait shooters and so in certain ways, I wish that I could go back and work for different, more different types of photographers. And I would probably say for younger photographers that are assisting, just shoot for, or shoot for um, being able to assist for as many people as you can, because those kind of um, small tricks of the trade that are really specific to type of, type of work, you only, 
you can gather so many of them in a single day of shooting with someone in terms of how they approach their 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 process that like once you're done assisting you it's kind of hard to go go back and, and find that out and then at that point you're kind of just like you're just building it yourself you're it's trial and error and that's you know there's something to be said for that too but it's it's definitely more time consuming to do it that way yeah no for sure i i totally agree and 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 learning from different photographers different styles is is hugely helpful for, for me i didn't uh, assist for any uh, architectural photographers back in the day it was it was wedding and commercial photographers so yeah. i never had the chance to see architecture so i feel like in in some ways it was kind of building from the ground up that way but. yeah for sure and like i had early experience of shooting um i assisted for these guys who did hotel like early like early digital late film hotel photography which was like the lighting and production was crazy like we were traveling with like 13 pelican cases we would light these spaces with like 50 tungsten lights yeah and i i think that that style is not is not relevant so much anymore but i certainly like i certainly took elements from that style of lighting that i might employ here or there in a much more refined way now and i'm just, you know it was a great experience kind of like have that in my back pocket to draw from now totally yeah no it sounds like we can relate on a lot of things I, i'm i'm 42 so uh yeah the, the brooks was a big deal back in the day the brooks institute um and uh now I want to, well, first of all, let me ask you, do you have any, who are some of your inspirations in photography? Who do you look up to? Whose work do you admire? Um, so I love to try to bring in other kind of more fine art, fine art types of photographers. Um, that's kind of like the work that I'm collecting, like on my bookshelf is more in that realm. And um, I think it's nice to kind of be inspired by other um mediums um most recently i think mark rudell he did a book called westward uh the course of empire it was like one of my favorite books robert adams um is incredible uh jerry joe Han is, is his name gary or jerry i think it's, it's pronounced with pronounced jerry um He's got some really great black and white work that I'm really inspired by. That's all kind of um, in the realm of space. Um, <laughs> I love Mark Mahaney's work. He's more of a contemporary. He like shoots like uh, he he had a period where he was shooting architecture, um, but he's now like he's more of a portrait uh, and fine art photographer. Um, and but I thought that what he shot when he shot architecture in spaces. Uh, was really really cool um i'm sure there'll there'll be others yeah. that pop into my head. those are kind of like the first ones i generally i love to take inspiration from other places if i can like if i uh if there's a color grade in a movie that i that i see i'll try to like bookmark that and come back to it later yeah um cinema color grading is often like really complex and beautiful um, and I think those, the people who are doing color grading for movies are such talents that like, um, I, we didn't always have those tools to be able to color grade in that way. True. I think that now they're built in to capture one, they're built in a light room to where it's like so much easier to, to, to create a treatment that can emulate, uh, a cinematic treatment or, um, or another treatment of film or what, you know, whatever it is you're trying to go for. And so I feel like it's it's part of my process now to kind of like pull inspiration color wise from other places. Um, and I a lot of times will build a mood board of images of my own or images of other places that I've uh, images that I've kind of bookmarked. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can kind of, you know, I'm never trying to match anything, but I'm trying to just get into a, a, a space visually, the kind of visual language that I can kind of like keep um keying into as i'm retouching um and that helps me maintain some consistency mm -hmm. to where at the end of the project i can kind of go back and just pull little levers yeah. and and kind of like make things feel concise rather than i feel like if i don't do it that way um especially if i am 
retouching over the span of 10 days. Like maybe I had to shoot in the middle um, where to stop or um, I think sometimes it's hard to maintain continuity when you're not like referencing a couple of, of things. Like I normally have like one um, image that I'm retouching on. I have another image, another monitor to the side that I've kind of like, maybe I'll build a mood board of like, kind of like of color that I'm kind of um, trying to reference and then I can kind of pull it all together in the end. Yeah. Yeah. I had an interesting uh, conversation recently with um, uh, Brian Wetzel, who is telling me that his, his, uh, uh, technique for getting consistency across the board is actually to work on uh, all of the files kind of at once and to and to stage them. So the first one is exposure blending, and then you go to stage two and you kind of work your way up from there. I thought that was an interesting approach as well. But these mood boards yeah. that you create, so you've got them on another monitor and you're just sort of back and forth referencing them as you go along just to find that color grading. And Yeah, and like it's, um, it's more for... Uh, uh, it's, it's more of an influence than it is. Like, I'm not, I don't really like look at it. Like I'm not really like going back and forth, but it's more like I, I'll check in and say, oh yeah, this is what I was kind of like trying to do. Let's make sure that I'm like, I'm in this kind of general uh, space, space color wise. Um, and then at the end, I think it's easier that way to kind of like to refine everything um, and make sure I'm not like, you know, going off the rails a little bit um, with a specific image. Because sometimes a specific image might take you in a different direction um, <clears throat> just because of what's in what, what the colors or the shapes or the, you know, the elements of that image are. It can easily send you uh, uh, in a kind of like in a sideways direction. It's nice to have a little bit of a, a reference point to be like, okay, well, this is kind of what we decided on from the beginning. And so let's make it fit within this this general um feel and then you know um this actually makes me think about like uh the pagination of how you approach what image to start with and i think it's important to start with the the bangers like the ones that, like the, the ones that are like really the cornerstone images of the project the ones that you're the most excited about and i think that generally like sh just like finding that image is a really important part of the process um and finding which image will be the one that will be the one that people recognize um from the um from the set of images and i think that's the one that you got to start with just because i think all the other ones will ultimately uh be referenced visually from that image mm -hmm. so i think that in terms of the color grade doing your uh your kind of heavy work up front on that one it, it kind of just makes the most sense in terms of the pagination of how you, you kind of order it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. Um, it, now I, I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, sort of your philosophy. Uh, if you have an overarching, you know, from 35,000 feet looking down on what architectural photography is or should be what your, what your creative and aesthetic goals are when you walk on set, you've got a very distinct, uh, style and and the creativity is very evident in 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 all of your work so i just want to know a little if you can sort of dive deep into your your brain processes that go on when you when you and maybe it just starts with simply showing up on set do you take a moment and just sort of absorb the space how, how do you do that um i so i'm actually i'm pretty process driven um I, and what i mean by that is like i always like to have a call first i want to talk about like the project. I want to talk about the goals that the architect had in the project, their kind of vision for how they, uh, you know, want the project to be seen, where they want it to be seen. Uh, because so sometimes that can kind of drive um, the direction of, you know, the visual direction of the shoot. For instance, if they're saying like, well, I want to make sure that we, we get, we pitch this to dwell or we pitch this to X, Y, and Z. Then I'll always think like, okay, well, let's make sure that we maybe get some stuff with people or we maybe um, we have it not be overly produced in certain ways. Mm -hmm. um, and then once I, once we've kind of talked about it a little bit, always do a scout, I if at all possible. I mean, sometimes with travel stuff, that's not, that, that just doesn't work out. But if it's in Austin or within like, you know, a couple hours of here, I'll try to go out and just like walk the space, figure out when to be where um and then i'll just map out my day based on okay like i know that that this 
kitchen gets beautiful light in the morning and I can guess that maybe later in the day, I want to make sure I'm in, you know, the back, the back bedroom or whatever. Um, then I can kind of start to plan out generally where I'm going to be when, um, and, and then the hard part is inevitably there's going to be stuff in between those where you have to leave some room to defray from your plan. You, you know, like if light happens in a beautiful way somewhere, you have to be able to say, well, you know, we're going to stop right real quick and just and grab this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's, it's important to hold your plan somewhat lightly. I think it's, I like having a plan in place, but then, you know, at a certain point, just giving yourself the freedom to, uh, to go off schedule a little bit too. Um, okay. I think that speaks to your question, right? I mean, um, yeah. And I know you can't sort of tell somebody how to be creative that sort of comes with, from within, but perhaps there are like, are there, you mentioned earlier movies, um, and, and color grading from movies or do you, do you sort of pull your inspiration? Cause you've done some kind of quirky things in, in some of your images that I, you might consider quirky, but they work, they work exceptionally well. Uh, so I wonder if, is there anything you can sort of, uh, describe as far as how you where you pull that inspiration from, or does it just kind of come out of thin air? That's a tough question, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I think that, like, um, I, uh, I definitely like to play well on set. I, I think it's important to try to try stuff, and I think it's important to say, like, like with your client, or if you're working with a stylist or whoever, like, let's just throw this in there, and this may be insane, but let's just play a little bit and see if this works. So probably for every image that you see that maybe worked, there's probably plenty that was just like, that was, that was not a good idea. Let's like, okay, that, that didn't work. And, um, and I think that like our job as, you know, visual artists is, to, is ultimately the, in the editing of those ideas, both on set and later on. Mm -hmm. So like noticing, like when we put, um, a prop or, um, uh, branches or whatever it is in the frame saying like, that's not it. That's not right. Um, and, or saying like, <clears throat> this image needs something, this image, there's nothing happening here. It doesn't feel like anything. So what, what do we have that can like, that can make it feel like something. And, it, and that could be, do we create some light? Do we, uh, add in some element of, maybe a person just left the scene and they left something, or maybe there is a person in, you know, like I think that knowing when an image needs something or it has too much going on, that's where like the real kind of skill comes in. That's kind of what we're here for is, is figuring those things out. Sure. Yeah. Uh, just quickly, do you work with a stylist, uh, an assistant? I always work with an assistant. I probably worked without an assistant maybe a handful of times in the past five years. Yeah. Um, I like the process of working with an assistant. I like to support the market of assistants. Um, and, and just from a basic like level of like, you know, safety of stuff and sure. gear, yep. like being able to like leave my gear and say, I'm going to go over here and look at this or scout this and, you know, make sure that my stuff isn't getting walked off with. Um, and I, I work with 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 Sal some, <laughs> um, but I also end up styling stuff myself some. Okay, uh, a nice mix. I love I love working with stylists. If if it's like in the budget, I would a thousand percent work with a stylist every single time. Yeah. Um, and it, even though like in that in that circumstance, I kind of take on more of an art director role. I still think it's so nice to have someone else who's um, who has a really great sense for uh, design and um, kind of what happens in what happens in two dimensional space. Be pitching ideas that you can kind of respond to because um, when you're the photographer and the stylist uh, at the same time, it's it's a lot of managing of what's the light doing. Um, what are all the props doing? Are we cleaning things? You know, there's there's a lot to kind of juggle. It's kind of like a um, a, a Rubik's cube that you're trying to 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 figure out. And having that one extra element um, uh, of talent on set is, I mean, it's the best. I you know I would always 
opt for one if if it's uh if it's possible yeah no totally and sometimes you can throw them into a shot if they're dressed nicely too um yeah, actually it happens like pretty much every time it seems like <laughs> yeah. uh, on that note uh you um you feature a lot of people in in a lot of your images especially your more recent uh, images um obviously that's a, a bit of a, an editorial trend that's that's going on at, at the moment um but are there aside from the, the trendiness of that do you feel that there are sort of um artistic or practical um reasons for including people in your images a aside from you know obviously providing scale or sense of function that kind of thing like what goes on in your mind from a philosophical standpoint of having people in the photos? I think uh, for me, it's mainly about, I want my images to feel human. Mm -hmm. And even if that doesn't mean putting a human in it, in, in the photograph and having it be kind of what we were talking about before, where it's, you know, an element of life that just happened or is about to happen. Um, I think it's all within that kind of ethos of making the images feel like they're being lived in they are um that they, they just feel human in general um and and kind of the thing that we were talking about before that which is that sometimes an image just needs something else another element to kind of make it feel like it's coming to life um or just to make it feel like something's happening yeah and do you find yourself sort of choosing the wardrobe uh to fit the um color um of the space or uh, or is it how how do you plan that out or are you hiring models is it just whoever the clients available how do you do that it's definitely a mix i mean there's certainly times where we're saying like we've hired we've hired models before uh for sure and in those circumstances we've definitely like are directed their wardrobe or had them bring up options um and then it's almost always these days since we're like we're shooting tethered we're looking at it on the laptop and deciding like now nah, this isn't working or this color is not working with the rest of the space and it's a lot of a lot of times it's responding um but then there's certainly been times where someone has walked through uh, a scene an assistant a stylist someone that was like from the crew that's just like worked and so we've kind of gone with it we say like oh this is this is beautiful. Let's just go with this idea and maybe we'll kind of adjust their wardrobe a little bit to fit within the palette. Um, but I think it's in general, this, just this mix of making plans and holding them lightly, giving yourself the room to kind of like to, uh, to freestyle or play a little bit while you're, while you're shooting, but also you're going in knowing like you, you want to be at certain part, certain parts of the project at, at the right time of day. That's that stuff is is always important. It's always been important. So, like, I think that having those kind of ideas up front um, is kind of uh, it, it's just crucial. I think it's just crucial to kind of build your day around those kind of key points of light in the space. Okay. It's kind of hard to get around that. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure um so i'm just noticing that your surroundings right now you're currently at your home in uh, austin which i feel like i've already kind of been there because uh you photographed it uh and it appeared in uh, dwell magazine how many years ago was that uh must have been four years ago okay -ish. so maybe Thanks. you can tell us a little bit about that process how that came to be did you what was it the chicken or the egg first how did that come about uh, talk about a process of like swimming around your own brain. Um, photographing your own house is probably the weirdest thing you could possibly <laughs> do as a as a photographer. Um, but like I was working with uh, my architect, who are really good friends of mine, and we promised to shoot it for them. And so we like at the point where we were gonna photograph it, I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I agreed to this because it just feels you're so you're so unbelievably close to it, and the uh, you're otherwise, um, when you go into a house, you have an editorial view. You're you're kind of like trying to understand how people are, how they've designed their lives, how they're living. And then to do it in your own house, it's like it's a self-portrait in a way. And, you know, all the things that I'm deciding upon, like, does this book go here or does this prop go here? It's all my stuff that I've thought <laughs> that I think is cool. So it's kind of tough then later to just like, you know, turn to get on the other side of the lens and say, well, actually, 
is this, I don't know, is this what you thought it was when you are all these, it's kind of like examining these decisions um, uh, all over again. So that one, I, I definitely needed a stylist and I brought on a stylist. She was the interior designer who I've worked with um, on other shoots as well. And there was a lot of leaning on her of like, uh, in terms of the, the, the kind of inclusion of, of different elements or, or taking them out together. Um, but yeah, I'll show you, this is kind of my backyard zone studio and there's our house over there, um, which, uh we designed with a firm i mean they did the designing i did the uh the, the clienting but um <laughs> this firm called uh side angle side is what they're called now before that they were just called my friends uh arthur and amy Furman, who are incredible talents yeah your home is absolutely gorgeous uh, i would definitely encourage everyone to go check it out uh, either through dwell or i think you've got them on your your uh, Instagram, that sort of thing. But um, you've got this really beautiful burnished uh, stucco and then it's just this mix of, of wood uh, and concrete and, and glass. And st- it's just, it's really beautifully done uh, and, and staged very, very well. Uh, and uh, and the photographs that you captured are, are, are of course gorgeous. You've got your, your wife and your dog in there. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's sort of an intimate uh, peek into, into your home. Yeah, I mean, it was certainly like a weird experience, to be totally honest. Like, I, I love that um, we we love our house so much. But yeah, it was it is just a bizarre experience to kind of like turn the lens on yourself. Um, and I, I think the other thing I will say is that like all the credit in, in terms of the design is, you know, goes to Arthur and Annie. Um, and also Ann Edgerton was the interiors, interior designer. Mm-hmm. And she played like a big role in kind of uh, in the overall process and certainly the things that we chose to put in our, to put in our house. Um, and the overall kind of process, um, I just learned so, I learned so much about, you know, architects and their, and their ability to solve these three-dimensional problems that I'm dealing with in two dimensions. Um, and I, if I didn't have, you know, an amazing amount of respect for them before, I certainly have it after um, seeing what what goes on behind the scenes in in designing a house. Yeah, no, totally, totally. And I can totally uh, appreciate uh, the the challenge that it would be to photograph your own home. I'm just thinking about the reality of you know, if I photograph my own, like that that same tchotchke has been sitting on that dining table for the last twenty years. I mean, I <laughs> I wouldn't even know to get rid of it. It wouldn't even click. Yeah. It, I mean, it's it was a completely bizarre um, experience, um, and I think that there was also a lot of I felt a lot of pressure um, when I was doing the house, taking part in the of the design process because I felt like um, because I've <clears throat> I've seen a lot of houses and I feel like there was this whether there was or not there was like this pressure of well this guy has seen so many houses, what will he do with his own house? So I kind of took on a lot of that pressure at the time. Yeah. Um, and then later on, kind of just like realized that that was maybe only only put on by me. Um, and once I kind of like let go and just like, um, and leaned on, you know, the designers and uh, uh, involved and everything kind of just worked itself out as it was supposed to. Well, I can kind of, I, I can see where you, the inspiration from your home has maybe come from, from a lot of your work, particularly the, the um, uh, minimalist design style of, of the American Southwest. And uh, it's, it's very evident in, in your own design of your home. Speaking of which, you've written, now you said four books. Um, I came across Santa Fe Modern, Marfa Modern, and Texas Made Texas Modern. What am I missing? Uh, I also did a book called oasis uh modern homes around the world okay um okay so that's that's four um i did a book called not forgotten which is a smaller book about um this uh this small area of um kind of like disregarded uh riverscape throughout the city of austin that uh, has since become 
developed and will continue to be developed. Um, it's kind of just like uh, memorializing that part of uh, of Austin. Um, and I did a book called uh, the, the University of Texas on Architectural Walking Tour. Um, and then I also did a book called uh, Paradox Cove, um, which was a about a private collector um, and his art collection. Um, so I, I'm not sure how much that, that's yeah. six or it's like six, seven books that I've, that I've wow. done over the past few years. Okay, now that's going to be an area that's going to be foreign to a lot of us. So I wonder if you can kind of explain uh, how that all works, what your inspiration was for doing it, um, what the process was like. Um, obviously, it was it was worth it to you, maybe from a, a career standpoint or a financial standpoint or an aesthetic standpoint, um, because uh, you keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, let's see what to tackle first. I think... Um, in the beginning, uh, I I went out to Marfa, which is a part of Texas, um, very far west Texas, for a design conference. And my longtime friend Helen Thompson, who's actually the writer yes. of these of a bunch of these books, um, she was also there, and we talked about how um, there was something special going on in Marfa post Donald Judd that there was like a kind of design movement that was happening in Marfa that was very of its own uh, uh, post Judd um, and it kind of like needed to be um, uh, explored. <clears throat> and so we thought, well, she'd done a bunch, she'd done a couple books books before that. So she was like, well, let's pitch this book. Um, and we did. Um, and I had no idea what we were getting into at that point. Um, and then we ended up making a book that was uh, published by Monticelli Press um and that featured probably 20 houses from marfa um and i just loved the process i got so i guess to your other your other question it's definitely not a financially driven uh endeavor okay uh in fact it's like you know you don't really make any money i mean it's uh it's definitely more for this the love of making books mm -hmm. and it's also it's a brand exercise for me just to uh, get access to a bunch of beautiful homes and have the ability to shoot them in whatever way I want. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of recapturing the editorial process that once was uh, in terms of, there's not a lot of, of magazine or editorial work now where it's, um where hey okay, um where we are essentially um being given assignment by a magazine and we go and shoot it that does happen i guess a little bit now but more so it's saying that um we uh we might know beforehand that like these are the places that a project might get pitched and we might kind of like try to shoot in a specific style to kind of support that. Mm -hmm. But in, in most cases, we're kind of um, most of it's supplied art to magazines from my experience these days. OK, OK. And so um, how did you find all of the homes? Did you scout them? Were you given tips, uh, you know, hot tips? How, how did you how did you locate all these places? Um. We, it, it happened really organically. So we probably started with five uh, houses that we'd kind of, I think a couple of which we scouted on this, on this tour, on this architectural tour that we were there for. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was like, oh, well, this architect, you know, did another house. And we would go and kind of check out that house. And Marf was really small. So it was like, um, it was like, okay, well, also like my, my cousin has this beautiful house that you know, that they designed themselves. And, you know, so we would kind of go and check out that house. That that book in particular happened very organically that it just, you know, we kind of, we worked our way uh, through Marfa and, you know, and, and met different people and and um, and just, you know, saw different houses and decided if they were, they were uh, a good fit for the book. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And beautiful. From the images that I've seen, it's absolutely gorgeous work. And the, the book's a really nice hardcover uh really well-produced books you can find them on amazon that's where i found them anyway um and um 
Uh, did you get uh, any concerns from homeowners? It, were they wanting a bit of cash for you to come in and do it? How, how did the logistics work that way? Um, on that book, no. Um, there weren't a lot of concerns from homeowners. I think most of the concerns from homeowners, the Santa Fe book, there was a lot of concern around COVID. And there was a lot of the Santa Fe houses had really incredible art collections. Mm -hmm. So I think that concern came later on in, in, in that book. Marfa in general, um, everyone seemed pretty excited uh, to be involved in a book around Marfa. I mean, people, um, especially at that time, were just, were so excited about Marfa and, and kind of like um, in West Texas. I think that like bringing an eye to the design that was happening out in, in that region was, um, was kind of exciting for everybody at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I think to your point, like there's, there's always that level of like, of balancing a homeowner giving access to their private space yeah. and being respectful of that. Um, and I think it's just something that we're always trying to be as conscious of as possible when shooting residences, because um we are in a way you know we're, we're studying them a little bit and we're studying how they've, they've designed their lives so um we always want to try to just like take as much care with 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 that process as possible yeah absolutely yeah no there and, and it's no small thing to go into somebody's home and <clears throat> try to pull five or six images i <clears throat> i don't know if you have a typical number of shots per hour that you kind of plan but um I, I imagine that you're probably roughly an average of an hour a shot kind of thing. Yeah, that's that's usually what that's I'm glad you say that. Yeah, that's a, a good estimate for excuse me, for planning purposes. An hour a shot. I mean, sometimes it's like uh it can be more, sometimes it could be less. But I think that for planning out your day, like I think that's a good kind of baseline um for pace. Mm -hmm. Um and it certainly depends upon um if you have a stylist how house like photography ready the house is um and you know plenty of other parameters in terms of like if it's a really really dark house that needs needs more attention with light that's another parameter yeah. um but yeah i think that like an hour a shot is 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 a pretty good guess for for timing purposes okay and then in are you typically working 10, 12 hour day. Um, so you're kind of telling your client expect, you know, roughly 12 shots kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So 10, you know, <laughs> we're usually on tens. Uh, and then depending on the time of year, uh, it can be a little bit longer. Um, and sometimes like, like if we're, we're in the dead of the summer, <clears throat> I'll try to take some time in the middle of the day when, um, when light's not as good. Yeah. Um, and and take a little bit of a break so we don't get worn out i mean a lot of times the dust shots are really important and so if you really go hard all day long for 10 hours and you're not as sharp at that really key moment where things are happening quickly at um at that dusk hour um it can be a disservice to, to uh, the process so we try to like make sure that we're taking a little bit of a break more than i used to in the middle of the day yeah no uh, uh... I, I imagine, especially in the, you know, heat of the Austin sun midday, it, it gets pretty rough. Uh, yeah. Um, your um, shooting process, I wonder if we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'll get into a specific image that I, I want to talk to you about. But but generally speaking, I wonder if, if we can talk about uh, your shooting process. You said you, you'll try to do a scout and then uh, let's assume we're, we're on the shoot day. You and your uh, assistant show up. Uh, how, how do you approach it from there? Um, I mean, I think kind of similar to what we were talking about before, where I've got like in my mind, say four to five images that I think are really important. And I think I, I need to be in a specific spot 30 minutes before when light is good, or potentially it might be 30 minutes before light gets terrible. So I've got, I'm kind of like working those things out in my brain um, as I'm kind of getting set up, like just knowing like, okay, I've got an hour here um, and I need to make sure that I'm, you know, getting to X, Y, and Z spot 
um, you know, by the time that's kind of in my head or, or written out in a schedule. Um, but I think that in general, I think, I don't think my process is that much different than, than most people's in terms of just like, I'm getting the image kind of like, I'm, I'm building the image on the laptop and we're slowly just crafting things with light, with styling. Um, and then, you know, at the end, making sure that I feel like there's just, I, I always want to make, make sure that it feels like something's happening, but there's an element of, but it's not just a static photograph where it could have happened at any time of day and it just happened to happen at this one i wanted to feel like it was considered that we we were at that place at that time and there's just something that's going on yeah time of day is very evident in in a lot of your photographs and you you use uh, light and shadow really well um to convey that sense of timing um now your maybe you can talk about what's in your kit for starters Oh, um, God, it really depends on the day, okay. to be honest. Yeah. I, I kind of, um, will plan it out, you know, based on, um, what I'm, what we're getting into for a specific day. Cause I do shoot like, uh, some catalog work and some, um, some brand work where we're like really bringing, we'll bring a trailer we have like, you know, a bunch of grip, a bunch of lighting, we'll rent HMIs or, you know. So it kind of just depends on what we're getting into on a specific day. Um, but normally I'm probably bringing um, four to six B1s or B10s. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a couple of D1s pro photos. Yeah. Um, and I have a couple of old uh, 2400 watt second power packs oh, yeah. that I can, that I can, one of them is a buy tube. So I can put 4,800 watt seconds through one head if I want to. Wow. Um, and so if I, if I really want to like, like make uh, a specific sun or a lighting feel and I need to like be way far away from a window outside and like key with a key with sun, then I will use that. I don't okay. use it all that often. But like if I'm like, you know, on a, in a specific scenario, like that is the only kind of way to do it is really having a ton of power unless you're like really cranking your ISO. And these days I'm using it less because of ISOs are becoming much more forgiving, sure. but you know, I, before maybe three or four years ago, I was shooting phase one and those digital backs were kind of shit above 200 ISO. Like if you, if you cranked it to 400, like it was really falling apart pretty quickly around the edges if you were applying any kind of LCC correction um, uh, to correct for color and um, and for vignette. So like that's kind of where that came into play. And sometimes I'll still find it useful, but most of the time these days I'm lighting with D1s and B1s. Hmm. Um, and then some, I mean, these days we kind of brought in some aperture um, LED stuff here and there, um, which is, it's nice to key with, uh, continuous light um yeah. just because you can see what you're doing i mean uh it's just plenty i'm sure that the people who've tried to key with strobe from outside there's plenty of like okay move it up three inches <laughs> yeah. move it over and then oh shit we need to like uh lower it back down and change up or you know change a battery or to re reconfigure something and then you got to go back up and then you're like trying to get back to where you were in, in some like very nuanced position um so having led go the direction that it's going now where it's becoming much more of a of a a possibility um is exciting so i'm, I'm kind of trying to uh employ that more and more yeah well i'm actually i'll be honest i'm, I'm kind of surprised you could have told me that uh you don't use any lights and you're an entirely natural light photographer these days uh, and i would have believed you um so yeah. uh, i think that's a compliment to uh how well you've hidden those lights so i wonder are you willing to kind of share a little bit of of your typical we, interior technique as far as the lighting goes like are are you you know doing your standard bracketed shots and then sort of bouncing uh what, what's what do you do <laughs> yeah i mean 
I don't think that I'm doing anything that's that different than the conventional wisdom of how to approach it. I mean, I'm definitely running a bracket um, and I'm lighting things. In most cases, I'm trying to, I'm trying to supplement the natural light. And if I can't, I'm trying to recreate what I think would be there. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm definitely from a technique standpoint, I'm running a bracket with and without strobes on um, so that I can kind of pull reflections as needed or shadows as needed later. Mm-hmm. Um, but just from a philosophical standpoint, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be at the right place at the right time to where I don't really need a lot of that. Um, and it's more supplemental um, or in a certain circumstance, like say I've just missed the light, but I know generally how it should feel. I'm trying to kind of like build off of the feeling of what, you know, what was previously there. Or if, you know, if we, if everything's gone, um, gone cloudy, I can kind of like, you know, use that reference point to kind of build um, natural light from stroke or something close to it. Okay. So if you've got a day where you're, you know, you're half in, in cloud and half in sun, are you trying to create consistency and maybe using your kit as a way to create that consistency? So you've got shafts of light coming across the wall or whatever? Some, I mean, sometimes. Um, I do think it's kind of nice to have a little bit of a variation between images to where it doesn't feel like every image um, was, was shot in the exact same uh, condition. Yeah. Um, but I think they need to feel like they were shot by the same person and with the same kind of style. Um, so I'm not sure if I have a rule necessarily about that. Um, I'm kind of responding things to things as we kind of go along. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think there's like a, a real like rule that I kind of adhere to, oh. um, about like the lighting technique more so that I'm just trying to like, um, supplement the, the natural light that I'm trying to hit. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's it just sounds to me like you've got a lot of firepower for supplemental lighting. It sounds like you could, you know, I mean, I suppose a lot of it, like you said, for adver- advertising or commercial work, then you, you're really crafting the light uh, and, and keeping it consistent all day long. But I'm thinking more like your editorial work. I imagine you're maybe just running one, maybe two lights kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think more often for the, um, I'm trying to think of like the circumstance that we're talking about, but um like generally in a house that's like that's like my house for instance it's like not a huge house it's like a 2000 square foot house no we're probably not like um putting 4800 watt seconds through a window um but in most cases we might be um shooting with two or three lights um keying with one and filling with the other two or maybe we like are supplementing in a back hallway with um with a a battery powered light um it's seldom that i think i guess in the editorial style that you're talking about mm-hmm. that i will really kind of override the sun and key with a really powerful light outside sometimes I, I, i'm sure i have done that before um but i i'm trying not to do that um just because i want to make sure that, that stuff feels natural and yeah. I think that you can make make it feel natural but it's just harder um and it takes more time and usually those shoots time is certainly a component of um like if we're shooting with people um uh, you know we don't want to spend two hours create creating and crafting light as we would for say a shoot for um a brand or for uh, a furniture catalog or something like that yeah yeah no okay um and then i wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh your retouching process uh like i said i mean your images you you can't see the the flash uh it is all very very natural looking so i wonder if you can um walk us through how you accomplish that in post um so i do i i I do retouch i have a couple retouchers that i use okay um and so it's a mixture of of both myself retouching things and other people retouching things um and, and my process with them is similar which is most of which i've kind of their old assistants of mine that they understand my process yeah. um, and so this the uh the process is similar in terms of 
we'll talk about a mood board or a feeling or a, a um, kind of way that we want to have the uh, the set of images go. And then we'll kind of do revision rounds, you know, along the way. Um, but in terms of my process, um, yeah, I don't, again, I don't think that I'm doing anything that's like that different than most people in terms of like, I'm like layering images together. I'm layering uh, <clears throat> different exposures, different um, uh, lighting plates. Um, but I'm just trying to be as, refined and um uh not the opposite of heavy-handed as as possible sure. um and i it's more uh i think it's more that than it is tech technique you okay. know it's more me making sure that i'm not like going overboard with i think that these days it's really easy to um with with all the tools that we have at our disposal to just like light everything in a space or yeah. um or make something feel like overly hdr um so i think it's you know it's more like checking myself throughout the process and making sure that i haven't gone too far more than it, than it is like employing a certain technique that makes my images necessarily feel different than another uh photographers mm -hmm. Yeah, so to keep with that theme of, of, of maintaining a simplicity uh, and an authenticity to the images, are, are you, would you say you're more of, you're, I, I kind of break it down into like three categories. There's the pen tool person, there's the mask person, and then there's, th there's the pen tool person, the mask person, and then there's the big soft brush person. So which, which one would you fall into yourself mostly falling into? I don't know if I can pigeonhole myself. I think I use, I, I'm probably a combination of a mask person and a big soft brush person. Okay. I don't yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think like balancing those two, those two tools, I probably fall into like probably that in between category. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you obviously have a healthy respect for color grading. You m mentioned it earlier. Um, and the color of your images uh, are incredible, particularly the skies. Um, that's one thing that struck me, the, the skies in, in all of your images. A lot of people, uh, myself being guilty of this uh, often, you just sort of, the sky is not part of the architecture, so you just sort of let it be. But y you treat the sky as, a, as another character within the image, and you uh, clearly put a lot of attention into it. So I wonder if you can just talk maybe a bit about the color grading but then also specific to the, your skies um let's think um i think actually i do like what you said in terms of like focusing on the sky as another part of the story because when i'm shooting i'm often really keying in on what's going on in the sky in terms of like the cloud and the, and the cloud within the composition so there's definitely times where I'm shooting a certain um, a certain scene, and I'm waiting for the clouds to do something. And and sometimes, to the dismay of my clients, I'm like, let's just sit here for I think like ten more minutes. I think that something is either going to break through or something's going to happen. Um, so I'll I'll come home with like a lot of different sky plays. Okay. So there's a lot of kind of decision making that's going on uh in the editing process of like what is the right sky to make uh to make the image feel right um and in terms of color grading um i'm not sure if i can like really like say if i have a like a uh a philosophy specific to sky more that i think it's important to make sure that your sky treatment fits within the overall color grade I think it's easy to kind of like take your sky and separate it from the rest of the feel of the image. Mm -hmm. And I think that's when things go a little bit wonky is if you're kind of like, you're not like at least considering it as part of uh, the continuity of the color. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily like um, take a sky and make it a specific way more. So I'm kind of, I'm trying to respond to what's happening in the rest of the frame and let the sky kind of fall with fall where it's supposed to um uh within the rest of the color sure yeah no and the colors are very complementary to the subject that you're photographing uh, do you find yourself doing sky replacements not that much honestly i mean 
I, it's, I think it's tough. I mean, so we, I've, I've definitely done it before. Um, and I think it's more where I like on a day where it's like um, a high cloud day, for instance, where there's like soft kind of like mottled sun coming through. Um, and then that, maybe you've gotten a plate that's like that's that's showing the building in that way. And then it's gone. And then maybe you didn't get the sky you needed. I think that is a condition that you can replace the sky where it's like it's a little bit of a more of a dreamy feel anyway and so you can kind of like blend in some high clouds and, and some blue and you kind of can get away with that in terms of like the overall uh kind of specularity of the light yeah um but i think you can just get into trouble like doing sky replacements in terms of like making <laughs> making them just feel honest and making them feel like they're like lit from a certain direction and feel natural so I don't, I try not to do it. I think, I feel like the times that I've done it, I've been like, well, you know, uh, I don't, I, I usually don't feel great about it, to be honest. Sure. Yeah, no, that's fair. And just taking a real quick step back, I also want to be respectful of your time here too. So I'm going to hammer through my last few questions for you, but, uh, you mentioned digital back. So I'm assuming you're shooting medium format. Yes. Okay. Um, now I'm a mix between I'm shooting the phase one IQ four on an Arca Swiss uh, <clears throat> RM3DI. And then I'm also shooting a Fuji GFX 100 on also, it's on a, I kind of switched back and forth from either that camera, the RM3DI, or now I just got a uh, Universalis, which is also an Arca Swiss kind of view camera setup so oh, cool that's kind of like going back and forth and that that's a kind of a this year development so i'm wondering like is this going to finally replace the the uh, uh digital back and so that's kind of yet to be seen okay interesting and um do you find um i mean it, it, obviously shooting medium format it's a bit of a slower process do you find that it, that helps you pace your shoot a little bit better a little, maybe a little more attention to detail because of the the physicality and the challenge of the camera presents? Not, not, not necessarily. And people, I've definitely heard people say that I'm good enough at going slow on my own. I'm oh, like, okay. I'm using to make sure that I'm like not going too slow. So I think, you know, the, I just enjoy the process of the functionality of a view camera. I like, like when comparing to like a rotating tilt shift lens, I think that those are the worst, like just in terms of ergonomics. Like I don't want to like to shift up and right by going like by turning the, the front lens sure. and getting my way up to that spot. I want to have an X, Y axis and go, I want to go up there. So I'm going to go a couple degrees over and a couple degrees up. And then I'm there. I feel like that process is just, I mean, I've also like been shooting with a view camera in that style for, you know, most of my career. So that kind of, um, feels really natural to me <clears throat> and in a lot of ways it feels easier to me like I'm just like you know I can get a scene squared up and kind of play with where I want the the frame to exist if I'm shooting kind of straight on by shifting up and around um, it just feels like a lot more natural to me than doing it with a tilt shift lens yeah no I can appreciate that I, I've been shooting tilt shifts uh, for, for years and, and even to this day like every once in a while you, you're you're trying to get that shift to that place and it's like you reach the end of the barrel and it's like oh wait and you flip it back and then and then all of a sudden the camera's up against the wall now you've got to do it backwards <laughs> now you're trying to yeah I get it so like and there's been times when like there was a, a period of time where I was shooting with a Sony uh, uh, A7R II, I think, that I hated. I just hated. I hated all, all, everything about it. I thought that, that, that it was a beautiful sensor. I thought the images were great. I thought the cam I thought the menus were insane to try to do anything. Um, and then, you know, all the things about shooting tilt shift I thought were like, you know, pretty difficult. And also just the, just looking through this tiny little uh viewfinder also felt sure. difficult and whereas like i feel like looking through the fuji and the size of it it feels so much easier to kind of compose uh in that kind of bigger feeling viewfinder sure at least for me yeah nope makes sense you know, awful. I'm getting like hit by a sun now. I see that. Yeah. It, it, it must be getting warm. 
yeah, the sun kind of came out. So now we're going you know, to like to deal with these blown out highlights. Oh yeah, no, look, looks good. You're getting a little Halloween lighting going on there. Um, your um, uh, do, do you use any software plugins? I, you mentioned Capture One, but uh, Photoshop Capture One. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just just the two, and sometimes I'll every so often I'll kind of play with Lightroom, um, and run like a a certain uh, set of images through Lightroom, but. I don't love it as a workflow to have to just employ another software. Actually, I really like the kind of quality of images from Lightroom. Um, but a lot of times if it's like I'm sh capturing through Capture One, then I'm outputting to Photoshop. Um, and then I'm usually like keeping my archiving system back in Lightroom. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes I'll have I'll use Bridge for something. It, it just feels like it feels like a lot of of different um, softwares to try to make a picture it just feels like kind of insane from a workflow standpoint. So I do sometimes uh, process through Lightroom, but unless there's like a really specific feel that Lightroom gives, I will usually keep it through Capture One. And but what I mean by that is I feel like um, Capture One, the way that the images <clears throat> are handled in, sh in shadow and highlight recovery I think is a little bit more chunky than Lightroom. I think that Lightroom is a little bit more continuous in the shadows. Okay. And so in, if there's a, an image that I'm, or a set of images I'm trying to create where I want it to be very smooth and soft, I might go through Lightroom for that reason. Okay. Um, but I, if it's more of a kind of traditional architectural feel where I think that, you know, it's okay for things to feel a little bit more sharp, um, and open in the shadows, then I, I probably will, will stay through through Capture One. Oh, interesting. I hadn't heard that distinction before, so that, that that's interesting. The software. Maybe that's crazy. That just that's just how I I you know I, I see it, and I'm curious if like anyone has ever thought about the difference in terms of like the 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 gradation of um it's to me it's all in the shadows. Um, I I think it's because a lot of the early Capture One shadow recovery stuff was built from their LCC um, uh, and, uh, algorithm. And that that algorithm was a very halo, halo-y based uh, algorithm. And so there, there was often like a lot of kind of uh, harsher um, gradations in that process. Um, and I think they kind of stuck with that. And I kind of wish that they would revisit it. I, I think this, that a lot of times in uh, the shadow recovery in Lightroom, it just feels a lot nicer. It just feels like it's more smooth. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, are you more in Lightroom or are you in, are you in Capture One or did you do both? I'm a Lightroom Photoshop guy. So uh, I have used Capture One, but I'm not familiar with it uh, very much at all. Um, but I'm surprised at how many people I, I speak to are using Capture One. Uh, and then when you start talking about things like, you know, chunky blacks and that sort of thing, it, there are a few photographers that come to mind that make me want to ask, which software are you using? Because um, they seem to have a bit more of that distinct style. So if, if they're consistently Capture One, that would be interesting. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear that also. Um, and I think that like, I think that Capture One has actually been getting a lot better with a lot of different things. And I think that like my guess is that the um the convenience and like the amount of other really good tools in that software are just slightly outweighing um maybe the aesthetics of a small part of of the way that the images feel that that Lightroom provides. Yeah. That's this would be sometimes. I mean uh, I think the workflow, it, when we're, you know, if we're honest about it, I think a lot of times you're, you're, if you have, you know, shooting 10 projects in a month or, or whatever it is, it's, uh, the workflow is a key part of the process. Yeah. You know, you can't really like, like, you know, just throw, uh, a different kind of spin into the mix willy nilly, unless you know that you have some kind of like time to, uh, to spend with it. Yeah. So. On that That's note, best. do you find uh, that you, there's an average amount of time you're spending in retouching a, let's say, hero interior? Uh, no, I feel like uh, there's like, it could be, 
I'm embarrassed to say how much I, how long I would probably spend on a single image, depending on what it is. But there's also times when things just like really click and they happen. Um, and there's also times where I'm really enjoying retouching something and I may spend more time than I should. My wife would, I'm sure my wife is like, if she watches this, she's going to be like, she's, she's a program manager. So she's dealing with creatives a lot of times <laughs> and trying to keep them on track. So I'm sure like she's many times thinking like, just wrap it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, speaking of which I can, I can see that sun slowly creeping up your shoulder. And I feel like when it hits your chin, we're, uh, we're going to be time out. So I'm going to, I'm going to hammer through this. Um, I, I feel like we've gone uh, too long for you here, but um, how do you, can you talk a little bit about how you bill your clients? Sure. Um, so I do have a studio manager assistant um, and a bookkeeper. Um, so a lot of that is through them um, and it's systems that we put in place that they're kind of uh, they're running with. Um, and that has <clears throat> somewhat come from, I had a rep for I think six or seven years. So once I decided to not have a rep anymore, um, I really liked the aspect of having a bookkeeper involved so that at the end of the year, my taxes feel easier to manage. And I know uh, at any point in the year, I can say what's in the accounts receivable. And I know it's what's in accounts receivable. Um, and I'm spending more time making images. Um, and so I, I, I liked having that when I had a rep. And so I want to make sure that I could still, you know, have that aspect of, um, of the business kind of taken care of. Um, but I guess if you have a more specific question, I'm happy to. Yeah, no, to... I, I was thinking more in terms of, uh, I'm going to assume a day rate. Um, do you have a per image fee? Um, how does that all, all, all that sort of stuff work? Um, so yeah, we are usually bidding a day rate and we're charging per image for retouching just to give it some sort of um, uh, incentive for people not to say, I think if you, if you have zero, um, uh, attachment of image to cost, then what do you, what's to keep people from saying, well, what can you do 50 images in a day and shoot really fast? So at least like the retouching part of it um, kind of keeps that a little bit um, managed. Mm -hmm. um, and we are on a day rate. Um, sometimes we'll, we'll build usage separately depending on what it is and who it is. Um, but in most cases for architects, um, a day rate is, is the way that we go about it. And mainly because I think that, I think we can kind of guess what an architect is going to use these images for usage wise. They're not going to put them on a billboard. They're not going to, uh, you know, it's not going to be outdoor usage, um, at some retail facility. We have a general understanding. They're going to put them on their website. They're going to, uh, maybe have some direct mail uh, or email <clears throat> uses. Um, and then I guess we can get into some of the kind of like third party. Yeah. How stuff. do you deal and with that? that? That's a kind of a separate um, discussion. So God, this, I don't know how we're going to bang through this. Cause this is like a, this is a big topic. Or, or I feel like this is one that's like uh, it's pretty nuanced and, and highly complicated and delicate um about how to kind of like balance that and if, um, if you have time now casey we can certainly dive into that if you want to do a part two to this conversation we can do that too uh whatever's good for you yeah maybe we go part two because I, I i do have like some real thoughts about that and i think that that's it's something that i saw on the site recently and i was really encouraged by the fact that uh, it seems like people in the industry are kind of galvanizing about this topic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what it's going to take to uphold some kind of standards uh, with the industry. Mm -hmm. um, because it, I've always tried to uphold those standards myself, but it also feels difficult to do that if I'm the outlier. Like if I'm, if I'm the only person in Austin saying to a specific magazine, no, actually, you do have to to pay for this. Then it's easier easy to pigeonhole me as like the kind of uptight guy or like the the guy that you know you know difficult to work with or whatever. But if that is if everyone knows that's what 
is expected and all the photographers are doing it. It's a lot easier just to say, well, this is how this is, this is how this works. Totally. And this is a, and just educate people that that's kind of like part of the process. So yeah, we kind of either I, need to all be on board or, or, or you're just going to end up being that one guy who's just the, the stick in the mud that's ruining it for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's definitely, you know, the way I feel about it. And, um, I'm not, I can get in, I can definitely go on a wormhole about that and maybe it is a part two, but I think it's a, definitely an important part of it. And I do like feel as someone who's probably in this, I'm probably in the second half of my career. That's, that's probably easy to say that I, that I need to be a steward of um, kind of the industry standards that, and uphold them to the best that I can um, based on what was kind of given to me when I started shooting. Um, and I think it's easy to not hold the line. Um, it's easy not to hold the line because, you know, especially if you're younger, you're trying to pay the rent. You're trying to get going. You know, there's plenty of things that like are difficult. Um, and it's, it's really tough to turn away work um, and, and good paying work based on principle um so yeah th there's there's a lot to delve into. this is a very in and i would love to dive into this with you more especially because you are an editorial photography and I, and I feel because of that you probably see some of the worst of the worst of people just taking images and using them how they want and 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 whatever so i would love to dive into this with you um and i i also agree with you in the sense that um uh we we run the risk as architectural photographers of 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 through apathy or ignorance or whatever it is of of not holding the line as you put it and uh, and ending up like a lot of those other creative fields where the work is just commoditized and cheap and and easy and and um, I think holding ourselves and each other to a higher standard uh, whether that be usage or or just intellectual property rights is, is super important going forward. And it, it's something that could slip away easily. No doubt. No, I think that that's totally right. And I also have a slightly, I have a similar perspective, but I'll, I'll add to that. I think um, the other risk that we run is if, if all of the art is provided to these magazines mm -hmm. and, and they don't pay for it. And so so it's all basically being directed and paid for by the architect who is basically the person who's being featured. It's this, it becomes this kind of like self-referential process and it starts to not be editorial anymore. Right. It's like, it, it's, 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 it's self-directed and it's almost just like, it's like advertorial. It's like basically what's to separate it that from basically just like a, a trade magazine. Sure. where everything is just an ad where it was all shot for the architect or all shot for the, you know, person who, who was being featured. And there is no real editorial voice voice because how can there be if the person who's commissioning the shoot is also the person who's being, uh, is, is paying for it and, and being featured. So it's, I think it's, it's running this, it's this delicate line that we kind of have to like, uh, make sure that we're, that we're not stepping across this like kind of invisible line. Yeah, no, for sure. Okay, well, I think we should continue this discussion because I think there's a lot. There's a lot to unpack here. Yeah, yeah. No, I I could continue asking you questions on that, but we'll we'll hold off and we'll dive into that another day. Um, uh, yeah, actually, my next few questions are all kind of related to that. So I just we'll wrap this up with uh, just a quick question. How uh, how do you think the next? You mentioned you're kind of on the second half of your career. I feel the same for myself. What do you see um, for the next? 10, 20 years, uh, you've created some books. So obviously there's a legacy component to that, but um, what, what, what do you see yourself doing in the, in the near term? I think uh, I definitely want to do another book. Okay. Uh, I've got one more book that's in the chamber that I can't talk about yet, but that I think will be a really special um, uh I'm hoping that it'll kind of just like in some ways close the chapter to the book, the the book period of my career. They're they're the best and I love making them so much, but they're so time consuming and you don't like uh they're they're financially difficult to make uh to make work. 
but I think I've got one more book in me that I want to kind of like, I got to get out of my system. So I think that that over the next couple of years will be um, what I'm going to focus on in terms of, in a lot of ways, I think about the book work as being my personal work. That's the stuff that's self-directed and that I'm kind of like helping to decide <clears throat> what houses we're shooting and how we're shooting them and, you know, what what kind of story we're trying to tell with Helen Thompson, who's the writer. And we kind of have a really great relationship in terms of um, going back and forth about the direction of a given book. Um, so I think that's my that's my next topic. I don't know if I can get into, oh, that's my next uh, kind of venture. I don't know if I can get into like the next 15 to 20 years, but that's my next couple years. Yeah. Okay. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, uh, this has been a huge honor for me. I, I love your work and I've really enjoyed uh, spending this time just going through it and also getting to know you a little bit and, and uh, how you work. Uh, I hoped that we get the chance to kind of continue this topic more on, on sort of the business end of photography, because I know you're going to have a lot to share and I'd love to pick your brain on that. So um, anyway, I really appreciate your time. Uh, you're a super nice guy and, and I love chatting with you and uh, I look forward to everything you, you produce in the future. Thanks so much. I'm so honored to have been, uh, you know, involved and yeah, I'm excited to kind of dig in on the, uh, on the editorial kind of like usage side, uh, <laughs> part two is, is, uh, is in the works at some point. Yeah, totally. Now, how can people find you? Uh, I am on Instagram, Casey C Dunn. My website is Casey Dunn.net. Yeah. Perfect. Th and those are and just so everyone can find that easily, Casey C Dunn, D U N N, uh, on, on Instagram. Um, yeah, go, uh, follow your, you're a regular poster and, uh, they're always beautiful. It's always tons of fun to look through them. Your latest, uh, staircase one, uh, that's just a gorgeous project from, yeah, it's really nice. Anyway. Yeah. Well. yeah. Good. Yeah, uh, super great chatting with you. And thank you so much for your time. I know we went a little over what we talked about, but uh, I, I really appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Good. Have a good day. You too.